age of five and for people who are deaf or have hearing loss. People doing recreational activities alone or with household members also won't have to wear masks. Violating the statewide order is a misdemeanor, punishable by up to 90 days in jail, though, and up to a $1,000 U.S. fine. Well, outrage is growing tonight over a disturbing video that shows a Kelowna RCMP officer dragging a university student on the floor and stepping on her head after a wellness check. It happened back in January, and that video is part of a civil lawsuit against the Mountie. As the CBC's Brady Stratton reports, the officer claims she, was, she used no more force than necessary to subdue the suicidal student. This is the video that has Kelowna and the rest of the country talking today and questioning police officers' involvement in wellness checks. The incident happened here at this apartment building for UBC Okanagan students. It involved Corporal Lacey Browning and a nursing student, 20-year-old Mona Wang. It resulted in Browning dragging Wang across the building's lobby in front of other students and then stepping on her head. Actions all caught on surveillance cameras. In a civil lawsuit, Wang says she was in mental distress and her boyfriend called the RCMP to check in on her. Wang claims Browning found her lying in a semi-conscious state in her bathroom. But instead of providing help, she says the officer yelled at her to get up and kicked her in the stomach when she didn't. The surveillance video shows Browning pulling Wang, who is lying on her stomach and not moving, down a carpeted hallway and later into the lobby. Wang is handcuffed and only wearing pants and a bra. As other students come and go, some stopping to stare at her lying on the ground. When Wang lifts her head slightly, Browning forces it back down to the floor with her foot. None of the claims in the lawsuit have been proven in court. However, the video comes in the wake of another disturbing arrest video for the Kelowna RCMP, where an officer punches a suspect repeatedly in the head. And it's also on the heels of other incidents involving police and wellness checks in Canada, including cases that resulted in deaths in New Brunswick and Ontario. Here in Kelowna, Mayor Colin Bazran says what he saw when he watched this recent arrest video last night is disappointing. It, you know, really disturbing. And I think it just uh, highlights the need for systemic changes. You know, obviously dealing with uh, mental health and uh, addiction issues is not easy. But what I saw in that video was incredibly disappointing. In a legal response, Corporal Browning says Wang was combative and she only used enough force to take her into custody under the Mental Health Act. An RCMP spokesperson says it's reviewing the video and the allegations and will determine the next steps to take. Brady Strachan, CBC News, Kelowna. And some late developments on that story tonight. An RCMP spokesperson now tells us Corporal Browning has been placed on administrative duties an internal code of conduct review and a criminal investigation are underway. Once that's completed, an outside police department will be asked to independently review the investigation's findings. Today marks two years since a 47-year-old minor hockey coach was gunned down in front of his Cloverdale neighborhood. Investigators say Paul Bennett was shot dead in a case of mistaken identity. As Rafferty Baker reports, Bennett's killer remains at large. It was a baffling daytime shooting in June 2018. A man's life taken in his quiet neighborhood. Paul Bennett was a nurse, a father, a husband, a minor hockey volunteer and coach. He loved our boys and encouraged them in sports and supported their dreams. He was Paul, one of those exceptional people not everyone is lucky to meet in their lives. In the days following the killing, investigators asked for information about Bennett's last few hours. Police called it a targeted shooting, and they tried to piece together how this caring member of the community could be tied to the criminal world. Those who knew him never doubted his innocence. It was still hard for our members to go through that and see that in the news and people talking as if Paul might have been involved and everybody knew there's no chance that could have been the case. The victim wasn't the intended victim. Uh, Paul Bennett uh, and we said it many times, was truly an innocent victim, was an unintended target uh, of a targeted shooting. Today, Bennett is remembered fondly by the minor hockey community in Cloverdale. It was always the one working with the kids who are the most scared to be on the ice and the most timid and making sure they had fun and came back every week. Two years on, Bennett's killer still hasn't been brought to justice. Jang says investigators have spoken to more than 100 people in the case. He says 
The case is a priority and still active. Police released footage of a silver Honda car they were looking for after the killing. Jang says they still want to hear from anyone who could help make a case against Bennett's killer, but that they are making progress on the case. I'm hoping that uh, there will be a day, um, hopefully very shortly, uh, where those responsible um, will be in custody, will be held to account in a court of law, and uh, we'll be able to share those details. Unfortunately, today is not that day. But for those who knew Bennett, today is a day to remember the caring member of the community that he was. Rafferty Baker, CBC News, Vancouver. Nearly 20 firefighters were sent rushing to an aggressive house fire in Surrey's Guilford neighborhood this afternoon. Oh, snap. My next door neighbor's house is on fire. Crews responded to the fire at 103rd Avenue and 143rd Street in Surrey around 1.30 this afternoon. A neighbor reported hearing an explosion before rushing out to see the flames. No injuries have been reported. No word yet on the cause. Well, their bags were packed, fares fully paid, and seats confirmed. But nearly 150 Canadians stuck in India were left standing at the gate this weekend, denied boarding at the last minute. Many of them from B.C. are still struggling to get home since India shut down its airports three months ago. As Belpuri of CBC's Impact Team reports, those stranded say it's another example of why the federal government needs to send help. It's a chaotic scene at New Delhi's airport. Air India refuses to board approximately 150 Canadian citizens and permanent residents on a flight to Tokyo. Delta resident Sonal Sharma was one of them along with her five-year-old son. Our kids were in complete distress mode. Our elderly were being, uh, were being harassed, badly harassed by the Air India officials. They were ill-treated. They, uh, they were not given proper responses. Air India staff maintained the travelers couldn't board because the airline didn't have a Canadian embassy list with their names on it. A call by Sharma to the embassy proved the airline wrong. Then Air India told them they couldn't fly because of an entry ban in Japan, where the Canadians would transfer to Air Canada to Vancouver. But the ban doesn't apply to passengers in transit. He's a manager of Air India and now he's saying it. I'm calling Delhi police to remove you guys. The flight left Delhi without the Canadians. The advocate for Canadians stuck in India blames the airline for what happened to the passengers, but also Canada's government. Had we been more organized, had we implemented flights for our taxpayers that contribute to our economy, this wouldn't have happened. People wouldn't be in a panic. Global Affairs Canada reports to date, 92 repatriation flights have brought home just over 15,000 Canadians from India. The Canadian High Commission in India says it's asked in writing for the Indian government to help make it easier for Canadians to come home. It hopes for increasing options for travellers, but can't offer any additional information. Meanwhile, a representative for foreign affairs in Canada says simply, unfortunately, the minister's not available. Various attempts to reach Air India were unsuccessful. In the meantime, Sharma is back with her family in Haryana, dealing with temperatures in the mid-40s and pandemic restrictions. Our Canadian government, please wake up. Please listen to our calls. Belpuri, CBC News, Vancouver. The B.C. government is taking steps to address sky-high insurance costs for condo owners. The proposed legislation looks to bring more transparency to that industry. But as Andrea Ross reports, homeowners are still in for a long and expensive road ahead. The current situation is unacceptable, and there is no quick fix for this problem. The B.C. government is taking its first steps to address rising costs of strata insurance. A report from the B.C. Financial Services Authority says premiums are going up by about 40 percent annually in B.C. In Metro Vancouver, it's even higher, 50 percent. It's a complex issue. Rising claims costs are part of it, but BC has other unique factors. BC and certainly in Vancouver is also at an earthquake risk where you don't see that in other jurisdictions across the country. Now the government has tabled legislation to amend the Strata Property and Financial Institutions Acts. One of the steps we are taking is to prohibit referral fees. This means that insurers and insurance brokers will no longer be able to offer referral fees as an incentive to a strata property manager. 
Other changes include setting clear guidelines for what stratas need to ensure and ensuring owners are kept in the loop on changes to their policies, like when deductibles go up. Some say it's a positive first step. I think what we saw this morning were some small steps in the right direction with the emphasis on small. Dubois says she's glad to see plans to end referral fees and require disclosure of commissions, something she says can have a big impact on insurance costs. Theirs went up almost 120 percent this year. Our insurance this year is almost $900,000, so a 20 percent commission would be quite significant um, to a broker. Others are relieved to see more transparency. Well, I think the announcement is good news for the public in the sense that governments are not ignoring this. They're paying attention. They're doing what little measures right now can be done to make some changes. But Geoventu wants to see more public consultation. This is still going to be another, a rough year or two ahead of us when it comes to insurance liabilities and risks. No quick fixes, but a sign for owners that insurance costs may have hit their peak. Andrea Ross, CBC News, Vancouver. In Vancouver's downtown east side, activists and supporters rallied for the safe supply of drugs in B.C. The group gathered at the office of the Vancouver Area Network of Drug Users on East Hastings Street. They say it's crucial to stopping the large number of overdose deaths we see each month. Since the closure of international borders due to the pandemic, the street drug supply has grown increasingly toxic. May was the deadliest month in provincial history in terms of drug poisoning deaths. Well, it was 35 years ago, but for families of the victims of the Air India disaster, the pain and anguish is still there. 329 people were killed when Flight 182 exploded off the coast of Ireland, making it the worst mass murder in Canadian history. As Mira Baines reports tonight, the global pandemic has forced organizers to alter memorial plans for the anniversary. In some ways, it's as if it happened yesterday. Renee Saklakar's uncle and aunt were killed on Air India Flight 182. She visited the Air India Memorial in Stanley Park to mourn them privately. A public commemoration can't be held this year due to COVID-19 restrictions preventing gatherings of more than 50 people. That's the terrible thing about these sorts of traumas. I think anyone who loses someone to murder, particularly a horrific, violent murder, there is a sense of timelessness. Relatives and friends are remembering 329 people who were killed, including 280 Canadians and 86 children, when a bomb exploded on board the airplane off the coast of Ireland. Two baggage handlers were killed at Tokyo's Narita Airport on the same day, when a suitcase exploded before it was loaded onto another Air India plane. Sushil Gupta was 12 years old when his mother Ramwati died on the flight. He's behind an online memorial to remember those who were killed for people who can't visit one of the memorial sites. What we've done instead is create a, created a YouTube channel uh, where we will be posting um, statements or messages from victims' family members, uh, some officials. Authorities have suspected the two bombings were an act of revenge by B.C. Sikh separatists for the Indian government's raid of Sikhism's holiest shrine, the Golden Temple in India. Only one man, Inderjeet Singh Rayat, a mechanic from Duncan, B.C., has been convicted in the attack. He was released after spending three decades in prison. Two other B.C. men, Ajab Singh Bagri and Raputaman Singh Malik, were acquitted of murder and conspiracy charges. Messages point for the need for justice and to never forget the tragedy. It is our loving responsibility to remember how the loss of my father and every other family member on Air India 182 was so grossly unnecessary. We miss them terribly, and they will always be etched in our hearts. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau delivered this message. I offer my deepest condolences to all Canadians who've lost a loved one to terrorism. You're in my thoughts today. Here at the Air India Memorial in Stanley Park, there are signs that people have come by to pay their respects. Family members of victims are hoping that they'll be able to get together to mourn and to heal in the future. Mira Baines, CBC News, Vancouver. So, Brett, not feeling so summery outside. What, what's going on here? A bit of a roller coaster today in terms of the weather. <laughs> 
It absolutely has been a roller coaster, and I think even more so now because it looks like the sun is just trying to peek out behind these clouds. But we've just been dealing with a lot of low cloud and a little bit of humidity to boot. But you know, let's take a look at what it looked like this morning. I've got a time lapse for you showing what it looked like looking over Science World and BC Place. You can see some really fast moving clouds up there, and if you were awake at this time, you know that there were a few little bits of drizzle here and there, and uh, that trend kind of just carried on throughout the day. And certainly by the afternoon, humidity was really one of the stories and if we look at some of the current temperatures right now you're going to be able to see that we're sitting right at about seasonal 19 20 degrees but earlier this afternoon Vancouver International Airport feeling closer to about 27 degrees when you consider the humidity that was there now the reason for this is because we are dealing with showers just in our vicinity so they're kind of all around us you can see on the Sunshine Coast there even making their way out into the Fraser Valley so that's got a lot of moisture into the atmosphere now as we go ahead for the next few hours the risk is certainly going to be there for a few more showers but there is a sort of light at the end of the tunnel, as it were. Tomorrow is looking to be a much sunnier day by the afternoon, and that trend's going to be continuing right through the week. Well, we'll look forward to that. Thanks, Brett. Talk to you in a bit. And a reminder, you can watch this newscast live on CBC Gym. And CBC Vancouver is also on Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram, and you can find both Mike and I there as well. U.S. President Donald Trump has announced new restrictions on immigration. They include a freeze on visas used by skilled workers. Coming out, why the move has many Canadians worried. Well, thank you for watching our ad-free live stream during the regular TV commercial break. Now, some Canadian medical students are reporting serious technical issues with their final qualifying exam. Problems, they say, make the test unfair. The Medical Council of Canada began offering the option of taking its exam remotely as a response to COVID-19. But as Matthew Kupfer reports, the students say the process has been plagued with system crashes and other complications. Medical students across Canada are reporting frustration, stress and even agony over technical problems with the Medical Council of Canada's qualifying exam, Part 1. The MCC has reported it's had about 300 complaints for the approximately 1,200 tests that have been taken so far. CBC News has spoken to students who say they've had problems with registration, contacting test supervisors, and being kicked off the online exam multiple times. The standardized test is the culmination of med school, with many young doctors trying to take it before they begin their residencies. We had a huge issue on Friday where the system itself just crashed and failed and many many students i would say more than two-thirds of the students writing on that friday um, were unable to complete their examination and many of them were about 80 to 90 percent way through the examination and to put it into perspective this is an exam that lasts roughly eight to nine hours so having gone through that much that time and effort to have all of that crash and to have to reschedule the exam is, is quite unfair. The Medical Council of Canada says the testing experience has been unacceptable in too many cases. The MCC says they're working to improve that experience with the U.S.-based testing company that runs the exam. For their part, Prometric says this is the first time a major professional exam is being offered with remote supervision. They say many of the issues stem from unreliable Wi-Fi connections. Both the MCC and Prometric say they're working to open more in-person test centers as public health regulations allow. Matthew Kupfer, CBC News, Ottawa. The British Prime Minister has revealed plans to begin a major loosening of the nationwide lockdown. Starting July 4th, millions of people across England will be able to get a haircut, head to the pub or visit a movie theatre. Today, we can say that our long national hibernation is beginning to come to an end and life is returning to our streets and to our shops. And in another update to pandemic rules, some people in Britain need to keep one metre apart now rather than two, so long as they take precautions and wear a mask. The changes only for England as Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland have independent plans to ease restrictions. Experts worry the government is reopening the economy too fast. And while there has been a significant drop since the peak in April, the country still has at least 1,000 new cases every day. The UK has recorded more than... 300,000 coronavirus cases overall, with more than 42,000 deaths. Very, very hard hit area. Mm. 
of Europe. And stay with us. We will be right back in a couple minutes. Seconds. Seconds. Donald Trump took his first trip of 2020 to the U.S.-Mexico border after announcing fresh immigration restrictions, including a freeze on visas used by skilled workers, especially in the tech industry. As Stephen D'Souza tells us, that has many Canadians worried. Under pressure, polls sagging, Donald Trump went to a place he feels comfortable, showing off the border wall and making the case. Under pressure, polls sagging, Donald Trump went to a place he feels comfortable, showing off the border wall and making the case for keeping foreign workers out of the U.S. So we want to give jobs to Americans right now. On Monday, the administration extended a ban on green cards and temporarily froze some new work visas. Among the categories targeted, H-1Bs, the coveted visa used by Silicon Valley to attract foreign talent. The administration says the goal is to open up more than 500,000 jobs for Americans, but it may be Canadians caught in the crossfire. People are very nervous. There's a lot of anxiety. There's a lot of questions that are coming out. Immigration lawyers are scrambling, trying to figure out if Canadians may be exempt. I tend to, to tell clients that we should take a wait and see approach. They're going to issue guidance, and when they issue guidance, we'll have to adjust our plans accordingly. Our interpretation is that Canadians do not fall under it. We're concerned that the Trump administration will take another viewpoint and will try to argue that Canadians do fall under it in some way. For some Canadians, the visa freeze is a gift. Irfan Raji helps tech workers having issues immigrating to the U.S. He settles them in Canada, where they work locally or remotely for American companies. So long as Canada can use this opportunity and other opportunities to attract and retain the best labor from around the world, it will absolutely help us economically, both short-term and long-term. Canada's tech sector has already seen record growth in recent years, in part due to U.S. immigration turmoil. Another question. A trend many see continuing if barriers in the U.S. keep going up. Stephen D'Souza, CBC News, New York. Of course, the pandemic has forced Canada to stop most traffic coming across the U.S. border. But there is pressure to get things moving again. Evan Dyer looks at how the government has managed the border and what it might take to reopen. Canadians think that we can stop this at the border. That was one of the last times the Trudeau government would insist border closures don't work. Three days later, the flight stopped. As growing evidence proved, Canada was wrong. The time is the, like the most important variable in this, yeah. This researcher helped advise the Australian government to close on February 1st. Her subsequent analysis found it reduced Australia's early caseload by 86 percent. We prevented yeah, a much bigger epidemic just closing to China at the moment was the best things we could do. Canada's COVID death rate is more than 50 times Australia's, but Canada has some issues Australia doesn't. Of course, Canada has a land border and its closure is not complete. In April, more than 10,000 people a day were still crossing over. Canadians living in the U.S. would like to visit family here, but quarantine requirements make it impractical. I haven't been able to see them in months. My grandson has learned to ride a bike. One of my granddaughters has learned to walk, and the other granddaughter has learned to crawl, and they've done all of that without me being there. Epidemiologists say the border makes Canada vulnerable. People are still free to travel between Alaska and the lower 48, potentially threatening Canada's efforts to keep COVID out of the north. And while the curve is bending down in Canada, the U.S. is trending back up again. Stronger efforts to, for example, test truckers. They've apparently anecdotally have been a group that's been relatively hard hit. We are going to be very, very careful about when and how we start reopening international borders. The government is still nowhere near being able to test the 6,000 people that enter Canada on an average day. In normal times, the flow of people is about a quarter of a million and would require far more daily tests than Canada has yet been able to carry out within its borders. That's how far Canada is from being able to reopen safely. Evan Dyer, CBC News, Chelsea, Quebec. 
Walmart is facing outrage over insensitive, even racist T-shirts and other products available on its website, often featured right beside Black Lives Matter apparel. Jacqueline Hansen reports on why companies have to catch up with the times. Police Lives Matter bumper stickers, Blue Lives Matter booty shorts and onesies for babies, t-shirts declaring homeless lives, Irish lives, red, animal and all lives matter, all for sale by third party sellers on walmart.ca. You, you got to be kidding me. This is, this can't be happening. Maybe this is a mistake. Sharon Rochester was shopping online for t-shirts for her and her husband, but ended up on Facebook calling out Walmart. I was disgusted. This is not something a company should be profiting off of. But Walmart has been selling some of the items since at least 2016. That's when police in the U.S. complained a t-shirt was stoking racial division. The company removed that one, but not the others. Walmart, all major brands, they're in a tough spot right now because they, they know they have to respond to the, the tone and the tenor, right, of our times. Walmart says it stands against any form of racism or discrimination, and that it will continue to review items on its third-party marketplace to make sure they comply with the company's terms and conditions. The more recognized you are as a brand, the harder it is to change. Because then they'll have a whole segment of the population where they'll feel like, oh, they're just caving in to the pressure. Amazon is also under fire for selling a Blue Lives Murder t-shirt. A petition to remove it has more than 40,000 signatures. The notion of Black Lives Matter is, is, is life and death for the Black community. I feel sad, um, then angry, and then I go into action. <laughs> I go into action. The Dean of Design at a Canadian university teaches her advertising students to consider this. Yes, we have a wide range of customers, but who is the most vulnerable? Who is the one who is most likely to be hurt by these messages? It's a lesson she suggests all companies also consider. Jacqueline Hansen, CBC News, Toronto. Well, BC did it. We flattened the curve. But how did our province become the anomaly? Was it luck or just smart handling? We take an in-depth look after the break. For 22 years, they've gathered to remember their loved ones. But for relatives of the Air India victims, tomorrow's anniversary will be different. This year, they'll meet at a new memorial on the edge of Lake Ontario. As the CBC's Joan Leishman reports, it's the result of one woman's tireless efforts to honor the dead. The finishing touches before tomorrow's dedication in a public park on Toronto's waterfront. The first of four national monuments to the 329 people murdered in the Air India bombing. Jayshree Tampi has endured more than two decades of unspeakable pain. Deep within that immense sorrow grew a fierce determination. Determination that if there could not be justice, at least there would be a memorial to all those who were lost. I'm hoping that people will be able to go there, sit, contemplate, reflect, and at least come to terms. And um, many of us couldn't put a closure to this, and hopefully we'll be able to do it there. Thank you very much. It's taken Tampi two years, negotiating with three layers of government and all the Air India families overseeing every detail. Today, she inspects the site with designer Peter Klambauer. So they have to... Yeah, we're going to re adhere them. At the heart of the memorial lies a sundial made of stone donated by each province and by India, the United States, Ireland and Japan, where another bomb thought to be linked to Air India went off the same day. Beyond the sundial, a granite wall bears the names of each person who died, including Tampi's husband and seven-year-old daughter, Preeti. And having their name there, you know, for future generations to, for, to come there and see that this person lost his or her life so that Canada will wake up to the reality of terrorism. 
Down a short pathway, construction is almost finished at Reconciliation Point with its view of Lake Ontario. A similar water's edge to the coast of Ireland, where so many waited for so long in vain 22 years ago. This evening, Tampi visits with her new family, her husband, who lost his wife on Air India, and their daughter. Like the other families of this still unsolved crime, she sees the memorial as a beacon of hope and justice for all of those who come here to remember and all of those who simply pass by on their way to somewhere else. I'm hoping looking at them will teach them to stand up for their rights, not to give up, and uh, to fight for the truth and uh, uh, be brave and courageous about it and not to just uh, give up. Joan Leishman, CBC News, Toronto. Here are some of the stories we're following tonight on CBC Vancouver News. You know, obviously dealing with uh, mental health and uh, addiction issues is not easy, but what I saw in that video was incredibly disappointing. Kelowna's mayor, Colin Bazrum, wants to see systemic changes to policing after a nursing student released surveillance video of her getting dragged and stepped on by an RCMP officer during a wellness check. Mona Wang is suing Corporal Lacey Browning for allegedly assaulting her. Browning denies harming Wang. None of the claims have been proven in court. Our kids were, you know, complete in, in complete distress mode. Our elderly were being uh, were being harassed, badly harassed by the Air India officials. Nearly 150 Canadians stuck in India were turned away at the airport just before boarding this weekend. Air India officials say their names weren't on an embassy list. Well, the Canadians have proof they were. It's been three months since India closed its airports to commercial flights because of the pandemic. Those stranded are pleading with the government to send help to get them home. We need to stay where we are, where we're having safe contacts, and we're not seeing dramatic increases in number of cases. As BC prepares to further ease restrictions, we run risk of increased COVID-19 cases if our contacts exceed 65% of normal. Dr. Bonnie Henry says the province is maintaining a fine balance, increasing the number of connections without seeing a dramatic increase in new cases. She reported 13 new cases and one new death today. And you may recall BC was one of the first provinces to get a case of COVID-19 and the first to record a death. And with thousands of travelers arriving from China and a spiraling situation in Washington state next door, there was every reason to think our province was going to turn into a hot spot. But it was anything but. So what did the province do right? How do we explain the success? The CBC's Briar Stewart breaks down some possible answers. I shouldn't have been at high risk, and I got it. I got a severe case. So it could happen to anybody. Kathy Novak had one of BC's early cases of COVID-19. During the first weekend of March, she was at a dental conference in Vancouver. Two weeks later, she was on her way to the hospital. So what was that like when you got in the back of the ambulance? Well, um, the whole thing was really scary because again, I thought there's really no cure for this. So at that point I was feeling a bit uh, hopeless that um, I don't know if I'm coming back home. Sorry. Hmm. Or in what capacity? Like, is my brain going to be working? Or, you know, what's going to be? So that was scary. A few hours after being admitted, her husband called to try and get an update. The 60-year-old was already in the ICU on a ventilator. That was when the doctor told me if we'd waited any longer, even one more day, she might not have made it. Might not even have been able to get her on the ventilator. It was awful. You don't realize how much you miss someone until it actually happens, and you don't know if you're going to see them again. That dental conference attended by 15,000 was eventually connected to more than 80 cases and at least one death. But even before that was on public health radar, BC appeared poised to be hit particularly hard by the global pandemic. Its airport is a hub for flights to and from Asia. 
And by late January, there were multiple outbreaks to the south in Washington state. COVID-19 arrived in BC soon after. Late yesterday, we had um, our first case of a novel coronavirus. BC recorded the first death in Canada after an outbreak at the Lynn Valley Care Centre in early March. It was what Dr. Bonnie Henry, the province's health officer, feared. Excuse me. Just take, just take, take a moment. And it left her shaken. I'm very concerned about I, I went through SARS. I've been through Ebola. I've been through um, the, the pandemic in 2009. And I just know how stressful it is for our health care system, for my colleagues, and for families that are dealing with this. But what has emerged is that BC's death rate is among the lowest when compared to many other large jurisdictions across North America and Western Europe. It's substantially less than Ontario and Quebec. And some health experts believe it's a combination of good fortune and sound decisions. I think a lot of what we did early on um, was very helpful. Part of it was timing, um, part of it was luck, part of it was um, people really embracing what we needed to do and doing it together. By timing, she means March break. Quebec had its holiday earlier, so people traveled and came back home. By the time schools were out in BC, provincial and federal health officials were already advising against international travel. At that point, BC was preparing for the worst. It was bringing in millions of pieces of PPE, including by chartered flights from China. The Vancouver Convention Centre was turned into an overflow hospital, but today it sits empty. Of all of the discussion around BC's handling of the pandemic, much of the focus has been on its management of long-term care facilities. Initially, there was some fear experienced by the staff, by the residents and families there. In the Vancouver area, Dr. Michael Schwant led the response team on the ground, beginning at the Lynn Valley Care Centre. He said at first they were testing care home residents who had typical COVID symptoms like fever and cough, but that changed. By mid-March, we were looking for a very broad array of symptoms, testing for those, and in many cases, finding cases who might have flown below the radar otherwise. Still in the weeks that followed, there were several new outbreaks at other homes. On March 27th, the government ordered staff to work at only one facility, but the move took time to implement. It was just last week that all of the nearly 9,000 workers who did shifts at multiple homes were assigned to a single site. This is where clearly public health expertise was brought to bear in a way that it was not in Ontario. Ontario didn't follow suit with its care homes until three weeks after BC first made its announcement. And Colin Furness, an infection control epidemiologist, says that's not the only difference. If I could put us in a time machine uh, and I could send Ontario back to early March, I would have an effective expert owning the podium and doing that communication. By that he means because while Premier Doug Ford handled the updates there in BC, it was Dr. Bonnie Henry. Furness believes her vast experience instilled credibility. And this is a very sneaky virus. But even though BC may have avoided the worst of it, Henry says it's still not time to take a breath. There are still active outbreaks in care homes and more than 165 people have died. Is there anything that you would do differently? Yeah, you know, um, I think about that. I, I, I think we can never get it perfectly right, but it's really hard to think about looking back right now. Um, we still have a lot of ways to go before we're out of this crisis. I almost died. Back on Vancouver Island, Kathy Novak is still recovering. She spent nearly two weeks on a ventilator and a month in the hospital. I did a lot of uh, reflecting and feeling lucky yeah, to be alive. She's still fatigued, but has slowly been regaining her strength. The virus caused a bright red rash to break out over her body. It's gradually fading, but the anxiety isn't. I'm still nervous about it. I'm nervous about people putting their guard down and being a little more careless. And uh, because even though hopefully I'll never get it again, but there are other people that you could pass it on to. So that's still a danger. She doesn't know if her husband ever got it, so even though health officials say they can now expand their bubble and have contact with more people, they're sticking as a party of two, which they're grateful for, considering how close they came to losing that. Briar Stewart, CBC News, Victoria. 
pain, anguish, and frustration. In another CBC News exclusive, we hear from the parents of Michael Kovrig on why Canada needs to do more to rescue the two Michaels from China. And it's 6.43. You are looking at a live shot of Canby Street Bridge there and heading up into the city. Unsettled conditions on the south coast today. Will we ever see some summer weather? Well, we'll find out from Brett. That's next. Peace represents is transformation, transformation of the education space, of the carving process, and of ourselves within that process. Quam. Quam. It's really nice how people can come together even through something like a pandemic and create something beautiful and put input into it. I felt really proud. I'm CBC journalist Will Fundal, and I'm non-binary. But what exactly does that mean? We'll answer some of the gender questions you always wanted to ask in our new podcast, They and Us. Listen now. The weather update is brought to you by WorkSafe BC. Visit WorkSafeBC.com for workplace health and safety resources, including COVID-19 prevention. All right, let's talk weather again. Meteorologist Brett Soderholm joins us now. So, Brett, we were starting with something different, though. You've been tracking some very unusual weather half a world away. What's going on? 
Yeah, well, we're officially into our summer months now, and it's pretty common to get temperature records that are broken here in Canada and across the world. But there was one such record that was broken this past weekend in Russia that deserves a special mention. I want to show you that right now. We're going to be leaving Canada. We're going to be traveling west over the Pacific, and I'm going to show you this community. This is in Siberia, where on Saturday, it is believed that this community here hit 38 degrees in terms of temperature on a thermometer. Now, this is pending confirmation, but if this is is true this would be the hottest temperature ever to be recorded in the Arctic which is anywhere north of 66.5 degrees north this community sits at about 67.5 and it has not seen a temperature like this in its history forest fires of course a concern and this whole area is just going through an unprecedented heat wave and it is a little bit worrying when we think of only getting into the summer right now and how that's going to be translating over the next couple of months ahead but over here back in Canada we should be grateful we do have a little bit of rain coming which is going to keep Keep our fire danger low and it is going to be bringing a little bit of shower activity anywhere between 5 and 10 millimeters or so throughout the overnight period and then finally clearing out sometime tomorrow in the early afternoon to maybe just about this time tomorrow that said places into the interior like the Kootenays and the Okanagan we're going to be dealing with a few isolated thunder showers as well but drier conditions are prevailing farther to the north so places like Haida Gwaii and Prince Rupert looking dry for the next foreseeable future temperatures in the north just to show by contrast nowhere close to that 30 38 degrees in Russia we're looking at much more seasonal temperatures here and for the south as well we're going to be seeing a noticeable increase though in temperatures when we get to Thursday and there's a reason for this we've been going through this area of unsettled conditions this area of low pressure that's going to be easing over the next 24 hours and right in behind it we're going to get a little protective barrier of high pressure that's going to be bringing up some warmth from the state of Washington and it's also going to be clearing up our skies and that's going to be sticking around right until Friday at this point so it does look at that point we may be dealing with a few more showers but if we look at a five-day forecast here we're going to get a nice mix of everything temperatures uh, slightly above seasonal but not too much a few showers here and there and Mike thinking of you especially for the first time and I don't know how long <laughs> it looks like Saturday right now may actually be rain free so don't hold me to it just yet but fingers are crossed that this does actually pan out wow what a breakthrough this is it's almost like summer thanks Brett well, last night we heard from Vina Najibullah, the wife of detained Canadian Michael Kovrig. Now it's Kovrig's parents speaking out, saying that Canada should do everything it can to rescue both of the two Michaels from a Chinese prison. The Nationals' Adrian Arsenault has this exclusive interview with Kovrig's father and mother about their pain and frustration. In an era of the coronavirus, this is the Kovrig family bubble. There's Vina, Michael Kovrig's wife, his sister Ariana, his father Bennett. Unseen, unheard for Kovrig's entire detention until now. I would like to see my son again. The strain of it, the silence, the time apart, it's all raw. Sorry. Bennett Kovrig's fragile health is the reason the family got one brief phone call back in March held back from talking to or about Michael for a crushing amount of time as a cost. To put it bluntly, we kept our mouths shut in the public for a year and a half. So I think that, you know, we have reached the end of the road in playing, you know, the, the uh, be quiet and uh, everything will be all right game. Scheme the so attention on. from the government, they um, say, has been kind and personal, but the words seem to have no weight. It gets to a point where rhetoric can only get us so far and... I'm scared I'm never going to see my brother again, and I don't know why those in power are so scared of doing the right thing. And the right thing, in their view, is to look again at legal options. Is there anything the government can do now to stop the extradition process of Meng Wanzhou, which could be the key to freedom for Michael Spaver and Michael Kovrig? It is an unreviewable discretion. The family asked lawyer Brian Greenspan to examine the Extradition Act. He says a 1999 change in the act means the justice minister can legally step in and still preserve judicial independence. The minister has the right to withdraw the authority to proceed and to end the extradition proceeding, and it's totally at the discretion of the minister of justice. The Canadian government, though, continues to say it won't get involved. We in Canada are used to and proud of the independence and the integrity and the respect for our judicial system, and will continue to do that. Has the government misinterpreted the law until this well, point? I, I think that they've ignored the appropriate interpretation. Let's stop saying we can't when, according to the law, according to the Extradition Act, 
according to legal opinions offered by very bright legal experts. We can. Vina Najibola sought the legal opinion, presented it to the government weeks ago, and didn't get a reply. But the Office of the Justice Minister and Attorney General released a statement to CBC News today in part saying, we're well aware of the laws and processes, and it would not be appropriate to comment further. I think it should have been stopped earlier. And I Former Supreme Court Justice Louise Arbour says she believes not only could Canada stop Hmong's extradition, it should, and should have done so a long time ago. Is it in Canada's national interest, including the protection of the security and life of two Canadians? I would say this has to stop. But I can see there are people who would make the argument that this would sound an awful lot like negotiating with hostage takers and there might be targets on the backs of other Canadians in China. That's true. That's one of the arguments. Unfortunately, we never really reached that level of conversation or thinking because we were told by the government from the outset we don't even go there. The matter is before the courts, um, you know, deference to judicial independence in this country. We can't do anything. This is not correct. We can. For the sake of the two Michaels, just have the conversation is the plea. And maybe angering the Americans is not a risk Canada is willing to take. But the family asks, just talk it out. Do the right thing. This is about people's lives, not politics. There are things that can be done that don't take people away from their family and their lives. His name might be a bit on the silly side, but the injuries inflicted on Freezer Crane are anything but. What happened to this Sandhill Crane and how he's recovering next?
Kelsey Grammer fans might do a double take when they learn that Fraser Crane was hit by a golf ball. Yes, but it's actually not the actor, but a recently rescued Sandhill Crane. Fraser is one of 35 Sandhill Cranes left in the Fraser Valley. They're struggling with habitat loss because of development there. They make do by nesting in golf courses and other watering holes that aren't a pub in Boston. <laughs> Fraser was struck in the leg and required complicated surgery to help mend his hollow bird bones. At least 10 cranes have been hit by golf balls in the last six years. He's now recovering in Elizabeth Wildlife Center in Abbotsford and will hopefully be back on the links in a few months. Yeah. Yeah. Speedy recovery. Yeah, they do yeah. hang out on golf courses because most of the golf courses have you know some kind of waterway there so mm -hmm. they hang out just on the uh, on the edge and it's not surprising they get uh, they get hit yeah it's it's too bad and it's interesting because the name is Fraser Crane and I thought it was in reference to Fraser but I think it's like it's the Fraser, Fraser Valley, Valley. Fraser yeah Valley, Fraser, yes. River, Fraser River all of those yeah. things and wasn't and it, and it was we had this discussion earlier isn't mm -hmm. it Fraser it is Fraser. I Googled it. I had to Google it. I'm sorry to all the big Fraser fans. Right. And before that, of course, Cheers, hence the Boston Pub reference. And that's been off the air of television since 1993. So there you right. go. Right. Just a little while ago. We're going to go off the air here. But Dan's going to be here at 11 after the National. Mm -hmm. Tune in. Thanks, everyone. Good night.